When making a video game, the developer's prime objective is to make the game good. You gotta have a story, you gotta have a soundtrack, the game can't just look good, it has to feel like a full body massage from the devs themselves. This is a terrible visual. Prank him, John. No! In simply accomplishing this one massive, grandiose, and third big word here task, devs can smile knowing that they gave you a good and complete experience and walk away with their heads held as high as their praises and sometimes their prices. But there is a very specific kind of dev that is just built differently. A dev that doesn't clock out after spending a few years making a game good and instead clocks in more countless hours trying to make a good game inside of a good game. Whoa, you're telling me that in this complete and already fleshed out experience you could also fight your friends in a death arena? Well, I better make sure that my belt is fastened or I'm gonna come game modes are always a welcome addition. Whether it's adding a new way to explore the already established universe, a distraction from the monotony of the main gameplay and story, or just a way to kick back with your friends and compete in some hilarious minigames, they serve a massive purpose for the legacy and replayability of a game while focusing solely on being fun. Do you remember that? Do you remember when games used to be fun and not an audition tape to join an esports team? So today, we're gonna dive into some of my favorites and just kind of talk about this. Or, uh, I mean, these because that's the name of the show. Before we get into examples, I want to take a quick second and define what a game mode actually is. A game mode is a mode within a game that plays different from the main gameplay. Now, I know I'm going to offend some people by saying this, but you can't just add a timer to the top of the screen and call it time attack, okay? Grow up. There needs to be a different objective, environment, or even gameplay style. I think the best way to go about this is to break it into subsections and then talk about my favorites. So let's start with mini games. The mini game is essentially a miniature game within the game. Wow! Believe it or not. Now, these aren't supposed to be deep or balanced in any way. Ew. And most of them don't even have a rhyme or reason to it. It's like the devs got together, ripped a fat duber and said, what if we made the scary gangster do karaoke? Or what if we made the protagonist bust down? Or even what if we put something actually fun inside of a Sonic game? That one's gonna piss some people off. They're just supposed to be bursts of entertainment taken a few minutes at a time. And because of that, they tend to come in packs because they are weak apart, but together strong. And sometimes the mini games can be even better than the game itself. Super Monkey Ball 2 is one of my favorite titles of all time. But if you've ever played a Monkey Ball game, you'd know that the single player campaign is more psychologically taxing than most horror films. It's slow and calculated and though it's kind of fun, it can only be played by one person at a time. Boo! Single player games. Boo! Bad. But all Super Monkey Ball fans, or uh, ballers as we call ourselves, know that the majority of this game's fun lies in the sweet, sweet party games. You have beef with someone? Take it out in monkey boxing. Are you trying to sit back and have a beer? We'll do it over some monkey bowling. Are you and a friend two nations divided fighting over governing style, resources, and economic crisis? We'll do it over monkey dogfight. Monkey dogfight. And of course, my personal favorite, coming with one of the greatest BGMs of all time, we have Monkey Target, where you and your friends have to glide and then aim to land on a board for the highest amount of points. Which is already awesome enough, but just listen to this song. I can't, hold on, I can't body rock because I'm like cross-legged, I'm trying. Like, they burned this song into my eardrums. I'm serious, get in there! The notes are right there! Now, I'm not saying that the single player mode was bad, but in the case of Monkey Ball, this game would only be a single player experience if it weren't for the party games. The fact that the devs sat down and focused on making something for the ballers to play with their friends is what makes these party games so special. Also, in Monkey Boxing, you can hit your opponent so hard, they'll fly to a different point of this video. I still have no idea why they made Monkey Dogfight though. It's 
seems a little extreme. But speaking of monkeys and dog fighting, have you ever played Pokemon Stadium? Everyone loves Pokemon. I mean, how can you hate it? There are Pokemon that look like bears, Pokemon that look like ice cream cones. My girlfriend says that this Pokemon looks like me. Uh, I don't see it, but I digress. Though you would expect Pokemon games to look like this, they normally look like this, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, and I've grown to love them over the years, but as a kid, asking me to wait my turn was the equivalent of getting chemically castrated. Fortunately though, these games came jam-packed with some of the greatest mini-games known to man. There was Ekans Throw, where you had to throw living snakes onto some diglets to score points. We had Togepi Tumble, where the baby Pokemon has to roll down a hill and avoid logs. Uh, and concussions, it seems. We even had Pichu's power plant, where this cute and baby rat Pokemon has to power a power plant, and if they're too slow, they get electrocuted painfully. Are these all death games? Are we doing Are we doing Pokemon Squid Game? <laughs> now, there are some games that realized the power of the minigame, and in turn made it their entire personality, uh, like when I discovered Mortal Kombat in the third grade. So these titles made their entire main gameplay based on this concept alone. The most famous example of this is Mario Party, where minigames is practically all there is. Sure, there's an overworld board section, or as I like to call it, the board section. Huh? Oh no. But everyone knows it was just a somewhat brilliant and rampantly unfair plot device to get us to the real action. Which can range from trying to bump your friends off the map in a ball-busting battle royale, playing jump rope with a rope made of literal fire, or rotating the control stick in the palm of your hand faster than the other three to drop them in a death pit, while also burning off so much skin that you see bone. I'm uh, starting to notice that these are death games as well. Oh no. No feeling could really compare to that sweet, sweet minigame screen popping up. It's kind of like gambling, except instead of winning money, you're kind of just hoping that you don't play one of the bad ones. Like the RNG horse races or the piranha plant chase where the single player can beat the other three every single time. Or just any of the games that used motion controls, like any motion control game at all. Nintendo had such a unique and weird fascination with motion controls that you would think that they were at war with Parkinson's. There's a lot of flubs in Mario Party, but I guess that kind of adds to the charm. It's like having one of the greatest bags of chips you've ever had in your entire life, but one in 15 chips was full of cyanide. The last few mini games I want to take a look at are somehow way more lighthearted than the ones we just talked about. And that's extremely ironic because these are from Mortal Kombat. Yeah, that's right. The most brutal franchise in the entire world has a long history of getting silly. They had a puzzle fighter, a test your might button mashing game, they had go-karts, go-karts, and they even called it motor combat. Like, how can you not love that? They even gave the characters chibi models with little go-karts that fit their overall theme. Look at Sub-Zero. They gave him a little sled. Now, I'm not just gonna sit here and pretend like this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. It was diced at best. But what it showed above everything else is this. And that's really what counts. Now that I'm done covering some of my favorite video games, let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Now let's talk about full game modes. Game modes are significantly bigger than a minigame. It kind of rests on the back of the main game and therefore plays very similarly except for a giant objective change or two. Maybe you enjoy playing Mario Kart, but you're just not a fan of going fast all the time. Well easy, let's just make the Mario Kart characters fight to the death in an active volcano. Do you want to take a breather from getting ring outed in Smash Bros? Well, just load up stamina mode and die instead. Maybe you're tired of getting spawn camped with slurs in Call of Duty and instead want to relax with some PvE. Well, you better keep f looking because Call of Duty Zombies is not relaxing. The true beauty of exploring game modes in an actual game is that they tend to be a lot less serious than the game itself, therefore lending themselves to the idea of being fun over being balanced. They can also serve as a magnifying glass to allow players to buff and explore 
explore different aspects of the game that the devs didn't fully accentuate in the main mode. League of Legends is a complicated game revolving around positions, map rotations, resource allocation, and making your teammates feel like they're worth less than the air they breathe. So what if instead of all that jazz, we just make the players fight to the death on a murder bridge? Yeah. That's all I'm gonna play from now on. Valorant is a high stakes, slow paced game revolving around an economy, skill usage, and map knowledge. But f that, let's add Team Gun Game. And by far, the greatest game mode ever made in the history of any game ever comes in a little title called Kirby's Air Ride. Now, this game is just a standard racing game. It's pretty fast, but except for the wonky controls, there wasn't really anything to separate it from the pack. But then they added City Trial. AKA the goat of all time. What did you just say? The goat out, if you will. Which transformed this game from being a standard racer to one of the most fun party games in history. Let, Let me, me explain, explain it. it. In city trial mode, you start off in a random section of a big ass city map. As the timer counts down, your goal is to drive around the city and upgrade yourself as best as you can. You can find other vehicles, which all have different traits. For example, yeah. this one can fly really well, but it's mega slow on the floor. Whereas this one is very fast on the floor, but it can't fly at all. You can also break boxes which contain stat upgrades in them or weapons that you could use to beat the brakes out of your friend and ruin some of their progress. And while all of this is happening, random events just occur, which can range from, oh, item bounce. Wow, now all the items are bouncing and they're annoying to collect to holy sh there are meteors dropping the size of skyscrapers get under something now or you're going to die but if all of that doesn't sound fun enough there is one more thing that turns the silly factor from an 11 all the way up to a 15. once the timer runs out you have to compete in a completely random mini game this can be a drag race a battle mode a mini game where you have to glide into the high number in order to score points and the list goes on so why is this so funny because if your smart ass got a motorcycle and prayed to god that the mini game would be a drag race you can get very unlucky and get a flying mini game instead and now you're in the motorcycle that can't fly and you're f <laughs> Maybe you got a bunch of stat bonuses for damage and you lucked out and rolled a battle mode. Now you can run around and one shot your friends who specked into gliding and lost the gamble. Skip it Skip it and if you ever noticed that your friend was getting too strong, you can literally chase them around with a bomb and blow their sh up so that they lose their progress. Now this sounds like it can be annoying. And sometimes it is. But the overall goofy, silly, and downright random nature of this minigame was something that was so good, I've never seen anyone replicate it again. Lord knows they tried. I mean it when I say that you owe it to yourself to try out this game mode at least one time in your life, because I used to spend summers playing this and this alone. If only there was some way to play this with your friends online. Completely unrelated, but I think that dolphins are very Cool. Stop! Now, there's one more type of hyper-specific game mode that I really want to talk about, but if I'm being honest with you, it's such a rare kind of mode that I don't even know what to call it. I literally asked as many content creators and actual human beings as I could, and none of them gave me the same answer. So I'm gonna go with afterthought campaigns. Normally, the campaign mode in a video game is the main event. Most devs focus solely on this, and if they have resources, they just add the game modes after. However, there is a very hyper-specific subgenre of games where the main gameplay isn't the campaign at all. But the devs want a campaign mode, so they try to force the main game to turn into that. Scientists actually refer to this as the Super Smash 
Smash Brothers Brawl Subspace Emissary Effect. These afterthought campaigns sound like they suck and are full of bugs, but even though both of those statements are true, I absolutely adore them. There's a very lovely bit of charm that goes around taking something that's really good and then forcing it to be something it isn't. It's like the almond milk of gaming. There are a lot of games that I could talk about that have done this, but I know how YouTube retention works, so let's do a tiny tier list. Super Smash Brothers is arguably one of the most fun fighting games in the history of mankind, and it was popular to a degree that DLC character announcements garnered more hype than most AAA titles. So what if we turned that into an eight hour story mode? Well, believe it or not, People f hated it, but since I'm like so unique and really different, I actually liked the subspace emissary, okay? I mean, sure, it was buggy, and a lot of the levels were bland, and most of the mechanics didn't even work. But as a kid, it was such an exciting time being able to play a game I already loved in a completely different way. Also, my older brothers were just way better than me, so playing co-op gave me a reprieve from getting my cheeks blasted. As an adult, though, it's hot ass garbage. But I still remember it fondly, so I guess that's what counts. Can we uh, put a tier list on the screen and drag this boy over to C tier, please? Tekken did something similar a couple of times. Only this time, it actually made for a pretty fun mode that I believe still holds up. Tekken as a beat em up is definitely a pretty funky idea. But since just about all of the mechanics from the normal game got to transfer over here just fine, it felt somewhat natural, except for for the movement and sometimes awkward camera. I mean, who the hell hired this guy? I took a couple of film classes in college and one of the first things they teach you is to not step out of bounds. In Tekken 6, they even added a bunch of cutscenes which showed the semblance of a story, but then in the newer titles, they cut it out completely, which blows ass. Which is why I still catch myself booting up Tekken's 3, 4, and 6 to play it again. Uh, let's put that up in, uh, in B tier, please. Now, now, we're about to get a little niche here, but that's because afterthought campaigns are so few and far between. But I'm sure at least some of you remember Soul Calibur 3's Chronicle of the Sword mode, which made you play a full on RTS where the battles took place in the style of the normal game. I know this kind of sounds like cheating because the main gameplay was just Soul Calibur, but the RTS mode was surprisingly deep. There were different maps, unit types, you'd create your own character and then level them up so that they they get stronger in the battles themselves, turning it into kind of an RPG as well. And it's just a very good example of how a game mode can be used to deepen a video game's overall experience, making it one of the greatest afterthought campaigns ever made. So where does that go on the list? Well, Shoddy, can I talk to you for a minute? Cause A. <laughs> now, there's one final afterthought campaign that I really want to talk about, which is by far my favorite campaign ever made. And it's also so niche that I kind of feel like I've dreamt it. And if I didn't have footage, I almost wouldn't believe that it existed either. In fact, it's so rare that none of my friends have ever played it. This is going to be extremely biased. But I absolutely loved WrestleMania 19's Revenge Mode. Before you unsubscribe and walk away, let me explain. Normally, wrestling games are kind of fun. You could play with your friends, throw them through tables, have hardcore matches, etc., etc. But in reality, playing in the same wrestling ring over and over again gets boring pretty fast. So you know what they did to circumvent that? They created a single player campaign mode where you had to get revenge on your mean boss while playing through gigantic stages. For example, the game literally starts by telling you to kill construction workers so they can't finish building the stadium your boss wants. I I'm not kidding. You just fucking throw them off. You have to break cars in a parking lot, throw people off of a cargo ship, free Stephanie McMahon from like a metal cage, and even run away from people people trying to jump you in a harbor. There was also this RPG element where you could spend the money you made on this mode and level up your created characters, making the missions get easier as they go. And even though it was incredibly unfair, bugged beyond belief and tilting to no end, I 
absolutely loved it. Oh, and the revenge mode stages were available in multiplayer, which was fun because you could just kill each other. I know I'm being biased here, and again, it wasn't that great, but I think that's the point. I can't think of a single campaign mode that I beat more than this one. So I'm gonna have to put this in an SF tier which stands for Scooch's favorite. Revenge mode kind of defines why I like Afterthought campaigns so much. It doesn't take itself too seriously. It provides the players something to do besides grind out rank points or lab out combos. And it was very clearly the devs trying to make something fun out of what they had, which I absolutely love, even though they never brought it back because it was kind of ass. But is it so wrong to love bad gameplay? What are you gonna do? You gonna throw me off a construction site? Well, that makes you no better than me. Okay. So why did I make a video talking about all of my favorite silly modes from random games? Because I think the art of a game mode is so important. When you strip away the need to complete a battle pass or increase your rank or grind EXP or whatever other task is being shipped to us in mass these days, all you're left with is a product that needs to be enjoyed. Game modes stand for the passion behind a game. The love child of creativity and fun. And because of that, a lot of my favorite memories in gaming is playing through these jank ass modes and laughing my ass off with my friends because that's what I was there to do. So whether it's a mini game like Monkey Target, an entire game mode like City Trial, or a jank ass afterthought campaign like the revenge mode in WrestleMania 19, thank you devs for caring enough to give us something fun to do. I hope that this video makes you go out, find your favorite game mode, and kiss it on the lips, because that's what I'm gonna do. I'm Scooch, and I hope that you enjoyed whatever this was. Now, I want to ask you, what is your favorite game mode in history? Except for City Trial and Kirby's Air Ride, because that answer is cheating. I would really love to know so that I can go and try it out. I hope you all enjoyed this video, but before you go, I gotta hand you something. See this? It's a subscribe button. Here you go. You should press it. You should press the subscribe button and, and stick around. And also ring the bell as well so that you don't miss a banger like this one. Thank you so much for watching. Now, if you'll excuse me, I got some construction workers to throw off of a rooftop. Hey! If you'll excuse me, I got some city trial I gotta play with my buds. That's all I gotta say. Please subscribe. Uh, I love you. Uh, goodbye. Uh -oh.